I think we'll just get going because it's 11 o'clock and there's loads to get through. So I am going to um, hand over to Andrew to do the sort of intro. Uh, we're going to take the sectors in turn and just run through the winners and losers of the year. Um, so, Andrew. That's okay. great. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, we have a great deal to get through. So um, Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, we'll have a gallop through what happened last year and hopefully learn a few lessons that we can take forward. Um, one uh, bit of housekeeping is that I'll just say if you have any questions, please do ask them and we'll try to answer them as we go along. So Investment Trust performance last year wasn't great, not a memorable year. It's the black line on this chart, the investment trust sector, compared to the FTSE All Share in the red and the FTSE All World in the blue. It's no surprise, really, that the blue line is at the top because the US was such a strong market last year and Europe as well. The UK wasn't great. Um, and the, the investment trust sector actually looked quite poor for most of the year. And it really looked like it was going to be a pretty horrible year. And then, of course, we did see this very strong recovery in the last two months of the year and some discount narrowing that helped bring it back to a reasonable level. So actually, at the year end, the sector probably finished the year pretty flat. It depends exactly who you ask and what dates we took, but it, it, it wasn't as bad as it first appeared. Uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and actually, of course, we spent the entire year talking about the problems in the alternative asset sector and the big discounts that opened out uh, in some of the trusts that were troubled there. But uh, I think to some degree that masked actually a very reasonable underlying performance from the big equity trusts across the sector, as we'll see. So the global sector, first of all, then, uh, had an 11% rise last year, which is very reasonable. And uh, there were some very good gains here. These tables are all sorted by the uh, one-year NAV return, uh, NAV total return, that is. Uh, so you can see at the top which trusts did best. And Manchester and London was top of this group, uh, which is partly, I think, because it's in the wrong sector here. It's, um, it's almost a pure technology trust. It's 97% tech at, at the last uh, fact sheet. So um, I think it's better compared actually to Allianz Tech and, and Polar Capital Technology, uh, but it's still doing incredibly well, actually. I mean, that's a tremendous return, 55%, uh, regardless of which sector it ought to be in. And the shares were up 63. So that was a tremendous trust to, to own last year. And I think it does contrast rather sharply with Scottish Mortgage, which of course many people will own, largest uh, trust in the sector. It, it, its assets were only up 9.2% last year, shares up 7.3% as it derated slightly. And that's a very big gap, which I think might surprise some people because they think of Scottish Mortgage as being another tech-laden trust. And to some degree it is, but I think it was held back by its near 30% in private assets. And also, I think it found that the in some of the tech stocks it owned that were not related to AI, uh, they didn't move anywhere near as much as some of those very big ones that, that were AI related. That was such a driver of the year. Uh, it also had some particular stocks like Moderna, which didn't perform well. So overall, it wasn't terrific last year. Uh, of course, one of the questions that always gets asked at this time of year is, you know, should I buy Scottish Mortgage now? Uh, I'll just say if you're asking that question. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I think there's still quite a lot of risk in the portfolio. But I think we have to be quite careful as well about, you know, writing Bailey Gifford off as a management house just because its growth style really didn't work very well last year. You know, it will come back. They're quality managers and ultimately they've got a lot of good holdings here. So uh, I think if you're a long-term patient investor, Scottish Mortgage is still something you might well, well want, to, uh, want to own. Uh, at the bottom as well, I'll just men mention uh, Linsell Train, which uh, had a poor year. I think it's holding in its management company was a big asset during the bull market, and it's been quite a drag, actually, in these more difficult markets. And it's also fallen to a discount now 
having been premium rated. So I think that serves as a warning, actually, for uh, falling in love with premium ratings. Uh, they they usually disappear at some point, as, as they have here. Uh, generally, uh, value, though, was the place to be last year. Uh, AVI Global, uh, Alliance Trust and Brunner all did very well. And so, you know, there were some very good returns here, actually. If, if you were just a, a, a good, long-term, patient, conservative investor, you probably did quite well here. Uh, smaller companies weren't so good last year overall, um, but it was actually very nice to see a better showing from Smithson, which has had a difficult couple of years, actually. But uh, it, it did provide a decent return last year of 8.7%, actually only 2% on the share price because it was derated. Um, but nevertheless, I think uh, long-term holders should probably take some comfort from last year. Uh, Herald is in this list, which is one of the trusts under pressure now from Saba. Uh, it's got about a 10% stake, I think, in Herald. It might only be five, but um, it's it's certainly very aware of that. Uh, as soon as Saab took the stake, actually, the managers were on high alert. And um, and I think it does serve to focus minds quite considerably, actually. And so, uh, I, you know, it's no surprise to me that that was one of the trusts that wasn't derated. It actually had a slight re-rating because that has generally been the case from the trust that Saab has, um, has, has approached. So um, it's already had some positive impact on the sector. Uh, just to finish at the bottom here with Edinburgh Worldwide, um, uh, Bailey Gifford Trust did spectacularly badly, actually, last year compared to its peers. And that really is um, quite a different performance there with a, uh, a downturn of 8.6% in the NAV and 13.8% in the share price. Um, clearly, quite a number of Bailey Gifford Trust did do badly last year because growth still wasn't in favour very much influenced by higher interest rates because these are long duration assets. And if you're valuing them on uh, the current cash flows and you're discounting those, then the current value goes down when interest rates go up. Um, I did read an interesting piece about Edinburgh Worldwide recently, which suggested it may get an uplift fairly soon from a revaluation of SpaceX, uh, which is uh, one of its holdings. Uh, I think that's great, actually. And I think we might start to see some better news flowing through from these private assets that are held by some of the Bailey Gifford Trusts. Uh, for me, it's still not a good enough reason to buy Edinburgh Worldwide at this moment, though. Uh, global equity income, uh, very good return last year, 11.6%. Uh, I think one of the key trusts in this sector, which did achieve a much higher profile actually through throughout 2022 and last year as well. JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, very widely held trust, this one, often appears on the lists of um, most traded trusts by private investors, uh, the, the uh, list provided by big brokers like Interactive Investor. So it's a popular trust. It did really well last year, really excellent NAV return of 17%, share price return of 20%. In in what was generally regarded as a very difficult year uh, across the investment trust sector, that kind of gain is really very um, uh, useful and and a good reason for having these kind of solid core trusts. I think in a, in a diversified portfolio, uh, the Invesco Select Trust did well. Uh, also, uh, that was top of the the list. Uh, one I noted that didn't do so well was STS Global Income and Growth. Uh, pretty. Uh, lackluster return. I mean, it was mildly positive, one and a half percent. But of course, that trust is expanding now through its merger with Troy Income and Growth. And um, I'm not completely convinced by it. So uh, as cash is an option as part of that uh, deal for the uh, Troy Income and Growth shareholders, I think you might want to consider taking that cash and maybe redeploying it elsewhere. Because um, certainly on, on the... Uh, the evidence of recent performance, that may not be the, uh, the best trust in the sector. Uh, emerging markets, uh, reasonable last year, unexciting, up about 5%. There were some good ones here. Uh, Gulf Investment Fund was a, a standout, and I know James has talked about that fairly regularly. Um, I think as well, actually, 
uh, a couple of the trusts that are maybe, I would say, at the slightly more conservative end here. So Utilico Emerging Markets and BlackRock Frontiers, they both did very well. And in both of those cases, actually, the yield is a considerable component of the return. And I think that's sometimes forgotten. I think emerging markets are thought of as a pretty pure growth sector. Uh, but actually, the income has been rising as more emerging markets companies pay dividends. Uh, and now they're quite significant. So from BlackRock Frontiers, for example, the yields 4.4%. And on uh, Utilico Emerging, I think it's quite reasonable value on a 137 discount. So uh, in spite of its recent performance, I think those shares are not very highly valued. You can see here that they produced an NAV return of 16% last year, but the shares were up 14 so a slight derating in spite of that strong performance. Uh, one odyssey here is the uh, JP Morgan uh, EMEA Trust, the uh, the old JP Morgan Russian, um, which uh, if you look at the stats here, they're, they're slightly bizarre because the NAV was down 14% and the shares were up 56 Um there's something strange here, but uh, I mean, that's because uh, some value is given to the Russian asset, assets that have been written down to zero. And uh, so you have to tread quite carefully when you're thinking about that trust. Yeah, and I keep making the point, people do that with that fund, but they don't do it with the bearings one, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. But there we go. Cool. Um, flexible investment then. Um, so the the winner here is Hansa. Um Obviously, this is a quite an eclectic bunch of different funds with different approaches. It's gone up quite a lot because it's got a big holding in a thing called Ocean Wilson. And one of the things that it's decided to do uh, is Ocean Wilson is an, an, a kind of strategic review. So they may sell off their Brazilian assets, and that's led to kind of re-rating of that. And that's what's driven up the um, Hansa and AV. Um, not really being picked up in the share price quite so much, but nevertheless, not too bad. And um, one that has perked up quite a bit is Majedi. Um, it's been through a number of different manager changes uh, recently, and now that it's got this group of Marabone partners running it and a kind of um, objective to make inflation plus. And that seems to be working uh, in its uh, in early stages. So it'll um, be interesting to see if that persists or not. And then I also thought I'd highlight the JP Morgan Multi-Asset Fund because um, I know we write quite a lot about that, but it is quite good to see this perking up. It's got quite a lot of its assets in equities relative to some of the other kind of lower risk funds on, on here, like something like Ruffer has got very low um, equity exposure. Um, and because equities have done a perked up at the, towards the end of the year, that's actually helped make quite a bit. Ruffer, by contrast, has been kind of like overly defensive um, and it's been caught out a bit um, when the interest rates were rising by having some a long bond exposure. Um, and I think quite a few people are disappointed in that. You can see that in the way that the share price has, has underperformed the um, NAV there, so 10, down 10.6. Um, and then on the other ones that are down here, uh, we've got UIL, which is the sort of sister fund to Utilico Emerging. It, it's a quite a sort of weird and wonderful thing. And not everything has been working. And Castle Nor. Uh, and again, you've got this disconnect between the NAV and the share price here. Um, it's big thing in the years. It bought Dignity, the funeral services business. Um, and, but the NEV was dragged down by um, poor numbers from Hornby and Cambium. Um, but people nevertheless quite enthused by the, 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 the uh, Dignity deal. So that pushed up the share price. So there's the discounts narrowed quite a lot. And that has an effect when we look at the next page because um, Aurora, which is managed by the same group as Castle Law, had a really good year. Um, they run this very concentrated portfolio. Um, and one of the things that they, they did have quite a position in was Hotel Chocolat, and that got bid for. Um, they also had exposure to things like Ryanair and stuff like that, which performed quite well at the beginning of the year as um, COVID restrictions lifted and, and their numbers picked up. Artemis Alpha has got quite a big stake in Carson Law. Uh, it's obviously not the same management group, different thing again, but they obviously quite like it. Um, and so they benefited to that 9.4% um, share price rise that we saw on the previous page. They've also got quite a big position, 
to me, quite sort of alarmingly big position in Fraser's, uh, the old sports direct business. Um, but that share price did go up over the year, and that's what's helped it. Um, at the other end of the scale, we've got the things that are more skewed, although this is an all-cap sector, they're, they're more skewed towards the small caps, so UK growth and um, hence opportunities both fall into that category. And also, as Andrew's already said, growth has been lagging. Um, and so things with sort of big growth stock exposures have not really been working yet, or there was a sort of slight perk up at the end of the year as rates started to, uh, well, hope grew that rates would start to fall. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. Um, within the UK equity income, um, this is what Andrew was saying earlier, that actually quite a lot of these returns are quite decent, really. Um, and top of the list there, we've got um, Edinburgh, which is a line run by Lion Trust, and Temple Bar, which is run by IWC. Obviously, the kind of more value style uh, funds seem to do better uh, in the UK. That wasn't true across the whole of the, the world, actually. It just seems to be like a sort of a UK thing. Um, I thought it was good news, actually, that Henderson High Income's done quite well. Obviously, it's got a big vote coming up. So on um, the 8th, so next week, only next week, it's trying to merge with Henderson Diversified. And, and it's been interesting to see how many Henderson Diversified shareholders switch across into HHI rather than take the cash option. We, we think it's actually not a bad option to take HHI because you, you maintain your yield and you've got more of a prospect for income growth. But we'll have to see what happens with what shares want to do. And again, if you had small cap exposure, you really lagged. Um, so that applies to the bottom three here, diversity income, Chilton, and also Aberdeen equity income, which has quite a lot of small caps, even though it's not really supposed to be a small cap firm. Um, and then in small in the small cap sector itself, it was still possible to make decent returns, but only if you're exposed to the things that got bid for. There have been a lot of bids in the small cap sector. There's lots of headlines about the de-equitisation of the UK market and the way the UK market is shrinking as private equity groups um, come in and snaffle things up that they think look cheap. Um, for strategic equity capital, it had a big position in a thing called Medica that got bid for, and that helped um, that strong NEV return there. Um, Oryx and Rockwood um, are all in the same stable as um, Odyssean. There's quite a marked difference in their performance, and that all came down to one profit warning. Odyssean holds a thing called XP Power, and, and that dived um, around sort of like September, October time. Um, but, the, but you can see value here. We were saying the, in the previous one, the value was, was better in the UK, um, and that's helped over fourth. Um, but also we have got a slight tick up in growth as well towards the end of the end. So we've actually got better numbers from, from BlackRock from Morton too, which is good. And then the other thing, we've already said that small caps have been underperforming. Um, small, small caps did even worse. And that's been persisting for a long time now. So you've got the bottom here, you've got Mice and UK micro cap, but also the Downing one too, and the River and Mercantile one. Um, we had Gervais on the, the show not that long ago. He's obviously thinking that his universe is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and at some point it's going to snap back. Maybe 2024 is the year that it happens, but we'll just have to wait and see. Back to you. Yeah, so uh, Asia Pacific, I think uh, this was quite dull, actually. Uh, nothing too exciting going on here, not too much to say. Uh, but I think you're right, James, that actually the the value phenomenon was something of a UK uh uh, thing because actually in the Asia Pacific, uh, growth was a place to be, and Schroeder Asian total return, which is top of the list here, uh, is fairly tech heavy. It does have big holdings in Taiwan Semiconductor, Samsung, Tencent, etc. Uh, but it's different. It wasn't huge. I mean, it, it it was it was ahead of the pack here, and generally does have a good track record. Actually, I do like that trust. Um, but the the real outlier here was Asian Asia Dragon Trust, which ironically is is the the beneficiary of uh, the merger now with Aberdeen New Dawn. So that's the trust that gets to grow, and actually that's an interesting point that we often talk about the rationalisation of the sector and how this is um, a very fine process that renews the the sector and makes sure that the best trusts survive. 
<laughs> that's not necessarily the case of course there are other factors involved uh whether you're part of the same management house for example but anyway there we are asian dragon trust had a bad year we'll be be hoping for a much better one to come we'll see uh pacific income uh again quite dull same factors uh there wasn't really much money flowing in or out uh again schroeder top of the list here oriental income which has been quite a reliable trust actually and is top of the sector over all recent periods. Um, it's, uh, again, fairly unexciting return, but perhaps that's what you're looking for from these income funds to some degree. The interesting one here is probably Henderson Far East income for a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, this trust always catches the eye because it has the highest yield of any equity trust. It's enormous. It's 11.3%. Um, but that has very much been achieved over recent years at the expense of growth and, in fact, the total return. And you can see last year it didn't fare very well, fourth out of five here. And that's been the case for a while. And now the board has recognised that and has said, well, actually, we think we need to tweak the investment process here. They're also changing the manager. They're promoting Satura to, to lead manager there. And they're saying, uh, actually, we're rejigging the portfolio to make sure there's a bit more growth in there. And that does mean that in the short term, actually, the income in the trust won't cover the dividend, but we'll use our distributable reserves to cover that. And I think the trust is planning to maintain not only the current dividend, but to maintain its record of dividend growth. So that could be interesting, because on the one hand, you're going to get that very high dividend yield, or all being well, uh, but also hopefully the trust um, rejig will enable a bit more growth to come through, so the total return will, will pick up. Uh, smaller companies did better in Asia. Actually, a reasonable return here of 9% overall, a couple of good trusts. Again, Schroeder, uh, uh, sorry, Scottish Oriental uh, on top here. That uh, rather like Schroeder Oriental income in the income sector, this trust actually is top of the table over all recent periods and uh, has done pretty well, actually, for shareholders. Um, I think it's quite attractive, actually, on a discount of 11.8%. And I think um, possibly a more popular trust, certainly, I think, a slightly higher profile trust anyway, is Fidelity Asian Values, which um, hasn't done so well of late. Uh and that's on a much narrower discount, about half, about 5.6. So if you're an active investor, I think there's a bit of a case for switching if you feel that the recent trends are going to continue. Uh, again, I, I'm not tremendously excited about this sector, but um, it's done OK. Now then, something to, <laughs> something to get excited about China. Uh, my goodness, what a terrible, terrible year it was. We started the year, actually, with quite high hopes of China uh, because, you know, it was coming out of COVID and we were expecting the recovery to come through. And in the first quarter, it did. But after that, actually, the fall off was horrendous. And basically, I think this performance is down to macroeconomic underperformance. The housing market's been a big problem in China, huge falls in housing. Uh, deflation is an issue. There's all sorts of difficulties, but basically it boils down to growth not coming through as intended. So the performance of the the four investment trusts was a completely awful across all four. Um, but actually, I'm not that surprised that Aberdeen China is about to disappear. I'm slightly worried about Bailey Gifford China growth, actually, uh, which also did quite poorly last year. That started off so well, actually, when it changed. It was the old Witan Pacific, and then it became Bailey Gifford China. Had a great period to begin life, uh, and we all thought everything was was uh, going well. But actually, it has suffered in the downturn. The issue here is that its um, market cap is, is only 123 million, and that is looking a bit small. So I think that could probably do with a, an uptick sooner rather than later. Um, but the trust to have here does seem to be Fidelity China Special Situations, is by far the largest trust in the sector. So if you're looking for liquidity, that's the one you'll have. And actually, its track record is, is clearly the best over recent periods. And it had a 
It, well, it was it was the the least bad of the trusts last year. I mean, they were all bad, but actually, a thirteen point seven percent drawdown in NAV is a, a lot better than a thirty percent drawdown. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting to to see what happens next. The clearly, again, this is something people want to have an opinion uh, on. You know, whether China is going to recover. I think it's in with a chance. Uh, it's um, targeting five percent growth this year. I think there's definitely been a policy pivot towards towards growth, but the difficulty is that there's still a big issue with confidence, I think, in China and the housing market and the property sector as a whole is, is really problematic. So it's not going to be a straightforward year, I suspect. Uh, my feeling is it, it's going to be, it'll be better in 2024 than 2023, but um, it might still not be very good. So I think you're taking quite a lot of risk if you're ta- if you're buying a, a a Chinese investment trust. The contrast is enormous with India, um, uh, and and this is often an either or decision. I think for investors, they're saying, "Well, should I be putting my money into China or India this year?" And and I think India was actually a considerable beneficiary of funds switching out of China. That's one of the reasons for the strong performance. Because I do remember we had this debate last year. I'm pretty sure you plumped for India, James. So well done. Um, uh, and but one of the issues was that the Indian equity market was highly valued, and actually, on a sensible basis, you thought, well, I don't know, it does look a bit toppy, actually. But those valuation concerns, which still exist, have largely been swept away. Uh, but they might come back because the PE ratio on the Indian market is actually quite high. It's pretty similar to the US, which I think is usually regarded as a pretty fully valued market, if not too high. And it's more or less double the PE ratio in other emerging markets. So you have to have a lot of faith here that the Indian growth story is going to steam on uninterrupted. Uh, But there's quite a lot of risk attached. Um, Last year, smaller companies uh, did very well, hence India Capital Growth Fund at the top of the list with a near 30% NAV return and slightly more in share price terms. Uh, That's a very, very strong performance. So uh, hats off to them. Ashoka India Equity also did very well again. Uh, I think that's really done very well to establish a very high reputation. And uh, it has actually done very well since launch. Uh, I think that's a trust that many people will consider in this sector now, and uh, I think with with good reason. Cool. Thank you. Um, Pause me to look at Vietnam and and Korea. Um, There's an obvious winner here. The Vietnam holding is just way ahead of the others, Um, and it just all comes down to stock selection, really. Obviously, um, Vietnam Opportunity's got some unquoteds in there, which which affect the, the way that its NAV moves. But nevertheless, um, Vietnam Holding has, has managed to, to do an awful lot better. And that's going to some sort of a continuation of its return to form that's been going over the last kind of two or three years now, really. It had a period of dull performance and then now it's come back again. And the shame is that it's still the smallest of this these three. Um, and I would hope that we can find a way to expand it in 2024. <clears throat> Um, by contrast, Vietnam Enterprise is actually quite sort of disappointing, really, and that's that's going to be the biggest fund of the sector. Um, the market itself had a lot of headwinds uh, in twenty twenty three. There's been some sort of scandals and stuff again, some more problems in the property sector. That they're working their way through those things. Um, the market, I think, is still cheap, and it's still one of my sort of favourite places to be in emerging markets. And um, Korea, um, this is really quite a dull. Uh, return for my career opportunity and actually quite a long way behind the local benchmark. It's not really, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated fund. It's, it's not really trying to be the, a career play. It is trying to capture this disconnect between the discounts on preference shares and the equivalent common stock. Um, and it doesn't always sort of pick uh, companies of just on the basis of how well it thinks they're going to do, the more about where the discount opportunity is. And that hasn't really worked in the past year. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens to that fund because it has sort of regular redemption opportunities. Now, back to sort of uh, more 
prosaic things, Europe. Europe is one of these places that I think everybody always thinks, like, oh, it'll be dreadful, and then it actually turns out to be okay. <laughs> We've had another year of that again here. Uh, the big winner uh, was Nova Nordisk, which is obviously uh, been benefiting from um, its fat loss uh, drugs, as um, and um and obviously only on the other bits of pieces that it does. And if you had a big position in Nova Nordisk, you did tend to do okay. There were some other big winners as, as well, but um, generally that was, that, was, that was the big driver, and that was a big position in Black Rock Race Europe uh, and in Helsinki Green Focus, I think. Um, there's been an element of the AI thing that we, we talked about with Manchester and London uh, happening here too. Uh, there's there's quite a lot of kind of semiconductor businesses uh, it's a little B semiconductor and ASML and sort of things, and if you, they are sort of the, the picks and shovels of of the AI sector, um, and so if you had those, you did well too. Which is maybe a wide belly gifted European growth is actually a bit better here than it has been in some of the other sectors that we've seen belly gifted funds. But small caps lagged again, uh, and you can see that here too. Uh, and the real disappointment is probably the JP Morgan European Discovery one. That's another Saba fund that they've, they've built up quite a position in that one. Um, growth, I think, will have a better year in 2024. Uh, and we'll see, you'll see, we've, we've written some um, stock picked things this morning, and I've actually picked Montenegro European Swords as one of mine. Um, I do think now that the, that sort of growth value thing is, is stretched a little bit too far. Uh, in Europe, and there isn't room for them to, to have a better year, and small cap too. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Um, back to you. Yeah, so uh, Japan got a lot of attention earlier in the year. Uh, I think many people were very excited, actually, that the Japanese market was picking up so strongly, and uh, it was being widely fated, actually, as you know, the, uh, the great market of the year. Uh, but it... <laughs> There were two problems. First of all, it started off uh, very, very strongly in the first half of the year and just didn't follow through in the second half. Uh, and the second thing is that, of course, we are sterling investors and the yen was quite weak. And that meant that actually the local market return of about 28% was really discounted quite a lot by that. So if you look at a mainstream trust like JP Morgan Japanese, returning 9.6%. It looks a bit disappointing, but that's the reason. And so actually, overall, the returns were a bit unexciting in the end. Uh, you can see up 6.8% on, on average. So um, the early promise didn't quite follow through here. Uh, and we have this same divide, actually, between value and growth, because uh, Bailey Giff of Japan uh, you know, which historically has been a very good performer in this uh, sector, had another really desperately poor year in relative terms. Uh, same reason, you know, growth just out of favor in this market. And actually, CC Japan income and growth, as the name partly suggests, you know, is much more value oriented. Um, and rather, as I said, you know, with the Emerging Markets Trust that did well last year, it's the, the dividend here is actually a, a considerable component of that overall return, so 2.9%. It's quite unusual to get a decent dividend, actually, from Japan. Um, we'll have to see if if there is a, a shift in that growth value uh, divide next year. Uh, I agree with you, James. I think in Europe and, and also the UK, there's certainly a bit of money flowing back into growth now, and I think there's a bit of an appetite returning for it. Um, I don't know whether that's going to happen in Asia and Japan as well. We'll, we'll see. Uh, Japanese smaller companies, slight underperformance here against the larger ones. Um, and so you might think, well, it's just a dull sector, not much to say. But actually, I think the contrary is, is completely true. This was one of the most interesting of all sectors because of the composition here that we have Nippon Active Value Fund. I mean, I think if I was asked to pick a trust of the year, this would be the one because uh, for several reasons, actually. But first of all, look at that NAV return, you know, 23 and a half percent in a, what we've already established was not a very exciting market, actually, for sterling investors. That's fantastic. 
also share price returned 38.7 so it had a big re-rating it started the year on a 16.4 percent discount finished the year on something like a three a three percent discount i think so you know very significant re-rating and that was driven in part by the performance part by the the trust playing a leading role in the consolidation of the sector you know it merged with two smaller Japanese investment trust. So it's played its part in what's going on in the renewal of the sector. And finally, you know, its activist approach was very much uh, on trend, I think. You know, this was working. So uh, I think finally, you know, there is some cultural change going on in Japan. And I think shareholder value is becoming a more central theme you know, we've seen this across the Japanese stock exchange, actually, and it's a requirement now for uh, Japanese companies to pay a lot more attention to this. And this has played into the hands of Nippon Active Value and also AVI Japan. So I think those trusts actually have tailwinds that could well persist for, for quite some time. Um, and I think that's a bit of a worry for, you know, Bailey Gifford, Shin Nippon, which, uh, again, was was the real hero of this sector. You know, I can absolutely recall when this was your first stop. You know, if you were thinking at all about Japanese smaller companies, Bailey Gifford Shin Nippon was the go-to trust. It had a tremendous track record. So I think it's going to be one of the most interesting uh, elements to look at here to see if it can recover its record. I think it's in with a chance, actually. I, You know, I think... Uh, it may well be that just as there are overriding macro themes here that have been against it and there are too many headwinds. Uh, but we'll see, because I also think, you know, things are changing in Japan. And uh, again, if I'm choosing one, I'm probably not choosing Bailey Gifford Shin Nippon just now. But yeah, I think you'd have to be quite brave to do that. But the rating has improved. You can see the shares have gone down by a bit more than the NAV. So um, uh, if you're a speculative bargain hunter, you never know that that could be one. Uh, North America. So this did really well, of course, because, you know, we've heard about the American market being driven by the Magnificent Seven, the big tech stocks. Um, they they drove the market on and overall the investment trusts uh, in the sector did participate, uh, averaging a 20 percent gain there. You can see I think it's terrific, actually, that the 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 stalwart of the sector, the one that, that we would typically choose as a core investment there, JP Morgan American did really well, participated fully, managed a 25% gain over the year. I think that is one that many investors will have in their portfolios. So I'm very pleased to see that. And the other big gainer over the year in this sector was Pershing Square Holdings, up just over 20% in NAD terms. Um, but here the shares underperformed a little bit, up 17. And um, I think it's extraordinary, this, you know, that actually... Pershing Square Holdings, you know, was in the top decile of all investment trusts by its performance last year. If you go back five years, uh, it's ranked third out of 253 trusts. It's phenomenal. Uh, a big chunk of that was down to its um, magnificent derivatives play, of course, during the COVID crisis. But nevertheless, it's been a very, very good trust to own. And its reward is a massive discount of 33.7%. I mean, I'm not sure how long the managers are going to put up with that, actually, you know, that they've already made some noises about it. And I think, you know, this issue of London actually struggling to be a home, actually, for many uh, companies. And, and I think for international investment trusts, that could be an issue as well. So, again, I think it's possible we might see some action here to either narrow that discount or we could actually lose Pershing Square, which I think would be a great shame. So that's one to, to watch. It is interesting here that uh, Bailey Gifford US growth actually is ranked third because, of course, um, this was a growth-led market. So there's no surprise they did much better here than they have in, in many other markets. Uh, I also have a soft spot for Canadian general investments, which actually did pretty well here because Canada didn't do as well as the US, uh, but it saw a good pickup in performance and uh, put in a, a reasonable showing there. Uh, North American smaller companies underperformed hugely, actually, against the bigger counterparts. This was very much a market driven by the mega caps. And so 
it was just a very, very dull performance, actually, by the smaller companies. You'd probably feel a bit sick if that's where you put your money at the start of the year. Uh, you missed out. And there's nothing really very much to say here. These two trusts both delivered a small positive return. So you know, that's in their favor. But actually, it's quite interesting. You know, generally, we do expect smaller companies to provide you with slightly more interesting, exciting, maybe bumpy returns, but some reward for the extra risk you're taking on. And in the US, that really doesn't seem very apparent to me. You know, there's the five-year returns here are also really quite lackluster. And um, I think maybe the US is just a market that is largely driven by the big companies and those are where you want to be. Uh, Latin America, uh, last man standing here. There's only, only one left. Um, BlackRock uh, Latin America had a fantastic year, uh, up 39.8%. Uh, absolutely scorching uh, and a pretty decent share price return of 32.8%. Um, it's always very difficult to forecast Latin America. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's a volatile market. I think it did benefit last year from being a long way away from Ukraine and from the Middle East. And uh, and I don't mean that to sound pejorative at all. I think it's actually quite relevant that actually um, investors looking for markets where they were not too perturbed by rising energy costs and other issues to do with uh, supply chain problems and so on. Actually, they did alight on Latin America as somewhere that was... Um, fairly free from those issues so i had a great year um and again part of the component here is a dividend um but i think you need to just be aware of how that dividend is created because it just comes out of capital uh, and i did read an article yesterday about the trust where it was included in uh, some long-term picks and um the writer was talking about the growing dividend and how that was uh, a good part of the return but actually it just comes out of the capital so all they're doing there is slicing off your money and giving it back to you. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think that does mean the trust can be on the radars of people who are looking for dividends too. Right, that's all of the equity sectors. So now, uh, well, well, sort of the most of the equity sectors, now we're looking at the sort of specialist equity sectors. So the first of these is the biotech and healthcare one. Um, and again, this was not a great year for this sector. Um there's been a lot of headwinds against it. I mean, uh, there were the, even within the Inflation Reduction Act, there were bits about drug price control. Um, but it's quite hard, though, to work out why this thing hasn't performed better. Um, definitely health has done better than biotech. And partly that's been the kind of unwinding. We saw that with, with Moderna and, and, and Scottish Mortgage, the, the, the unwinding of um, the really big performance that some funds had on the back of the vaccines for COVID. Um, but now um, it does leave the sector looking quite cheap. And I think there are some funds that can be quite interesting this year in this, within this group. <clears throat> now, obviously though, there's a, there's a stock selection thing at play as well. Um, within Syncona, they had quite a hit because they'd sold a business, um, Gyroscope, and the acquirer decided that they weren't going to progress with the um, uh, treatment that the, the Gyroscope had. Um, and so they were, that meant they had to write off a whole bunch of potential kind of milestone payments in the future. So that was a big knock on their NAV. Um, I wouldn't read too much into the Adams returns um, although it's in this sector, it's got quite a lot of non-healthcare related investments in there. And I think they were part of the reason that it unperformed. It's also very tiny. It's only like a few million quid. Um, commodities. Uh, again, this was not a great year for commodities. Um, and you can see that in the numbers here. The only one that stands out as, as a really strong returns is Geica Counter. And that's because... Uranium has been extremely strong. There were um, stories again in the FT, I think, this morning about um, hedge funds stockpiling uranium because the, um, as we try and track on climate change, building more nuclear power plants is seen as a, a good way of, of uh, achieving reductions in CO2 output. So um, that is increasing demand for uranium. 
and there hasn't been an awful lot of supply new supply brought on because the uranium price has been quite weak for a long time so miners just haven't been developing new mines um so and the, the inflection point for for actually doing that for, for bringing new supply on um has been a, a way off so i think we, we we've written a note about this so it's probably best to go and read that rather than me um going up um and, and try and explain it in more detail here. Um, oil price didn't help. There are some funds in here that have exposure to oil, things like Riverstone, also BlackRock Energy and Resources. And um, so that was disappointing. Um, I think weak China's had a big uh, problem within the sector. That's just one of the things that will, that's definitely weighed on it. The really interesting one, I think, is maybe Golden Prospect, because we've highlighted that a couple of times recently. There's, there's been a disconnect between what is relatively strong gold price and the, the uh, share price of gold and prospect precious metals. And I think that's just down to the fact that it holds small cap um, stocks. And as you know, small caps being generally not quite so um, exciting uh, the last couple, couple of years. And I just I think actually it's sort of, again, it, there's, this disconnect looks too big to me. And so um, I know that one of my colleagues has picked it as um, his potential winner for 2024. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. Tiger royalties is tiny. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Baker Steel, though, is one that Andrew's talked about a couple of times. Um, and again, that comes down to individual things, problems within its portfolio. Um, the environmental stuff, uh, again, has been quite disappointing. Um there's been a sort of, it's not a backlash against ESG, but generally I think there were a lot of money flowed into ESG, sustainable type funds, and it's been flowing back out again as the returns, and that sort of compounds the problem, the returns aren't quite exciting, and um, sort of, uh, you'll see a gradual sort of hit to share prices because of that. The one that bucked the trend there, Manhattan, it, we've been saying for ages, it's not really uh, a typical environmental fund. It's got big positions in some of the ones, the stocks that have been, um, they're, they're sort of magnificent selling type stocks, so Microsoft, Alphabet, and Amazon, and that's what's driven its NAV returns. Um, so it, that's why it's got this kind of weird disconnect. I wouldn't try and extrapolate from that, though. Financials started off very well. Um as interest rates have been rising, then uh, margins that banks can make have been rising, uh, and that was all looked quite good news. But there were some banks that had not set up their business to be able to cope with the rising rate environment. And we saw that in March with the collapse of things like SVB and some of the more um, some of the other regional US banks. And then uh, close to home with the collapse of Credit Suisse and that not confidence in the sector um, and really weighed on returns. So public cap financials, it's done okay. It's marginally behind its benchmark, um, but I think it's hoping for a better year this year. And because we've said growth stocks have been out of favour, so that means um, fintech hasn't um, maybe uh, sparkled as much as it might have done otherwise. Um, I know Lord Benton uh, are on the show next week, so you have a chance to hear for the manager of that fund about why he thinks that the 2024 might be a better year for that fund. Mm. Rising interest rates were a big headwind to utilities and infrastructure stocks, as we'll see when we come on to the um, funds that listen these things directly. Um, for Ecofin, which obviously invested in listed companies in that area, and Premier Mighton Fund, which is also invested in the same sort of things, but is geared into those returns because of its zero dividend uh, preference share structure um it was a difficult year uh, and not only did the the navs fall but the discounts widened too that is turning you've seen you've seen the turn actually quite a big jump in the ecofin uh, nav since um interest rates peaked in or, or the, the u.s treasury yields peaked in october um and so I think actually this might be a better year for this sector now. Um, definitely the, the manager's quite enthused about that. Um, so we'll have to see how that works out. And then the really big winner, uh, we, we saw Manchester London, I think is probably the best performing, by one tiny little minnow thing, the best performing uh, fund in the sector. 
but not far behind it are the two tech funds, Paolo Cap Tech and Anians Technology. And this is all on the back of this Magnificent 7 AI type stuff. Um, Paolo Cap Tech just, just pips, you know, Panias Technology to the post and the winner here. Uh, and actually had a, a better share price returns on the back of that. Um, and again, Shore Ventures, it's, it's investing in sort of tiny things, little growthy type things that, that didn't benefit from all that sort of AI type um, excitement. So um, I wouldn't go chasing that one. Back to you. Yeah, we're going to delve into some more esoteric areas here in the debt sectors. And I don't know if these are of interest to quite as many people, so I will rush through these a little bit. Uh, generally, they did quite well, though. Uh, direct lending was OK, up 4.5% on average. Uh, some reasonable performances here in spite of some individual issues. I and mean, one of those that we know about is Biofarm Credit, which is bottom of this list. Um, it has just resolved, actually, uh, its issue with Lumira DX, the, the big uh, problem it's had. And actually a good, out well, a, a reasonable outcome. Uh, the trust invested about 180 million pounds there in the in the loan. Uh, it wrote it down to about 126 million dollars. Sorry, dollars I, uh, rather than pounds. And um, it's now actually being able to to exit that position and should be able to realize about 145 million dollars. So uh, an uplift to its written down value, although a loss overall. Um, but this also means that the trust is now free and indeed committed to uh, its buyback program. So, uh, you know, I think that augurs well, uh, and hopefully that episode is behind it. But there were some reasonable returns here. Pollen Street is top. Riverstone Credit Opportunities, I like. That has a continuation vote coming up, which will be quite interesting. And there are, of course, some reconstructions going on here. So uh, GCP Asset Backed Income has a strategic review ahead of its continuation vote in May. I'd be quite surprised if that continued. Remember, that failed to merge with GCP infrastructure last year. And VPC specialty lending is also in wind down. Uh, its share price has been fairly weak of late, and you can see that actually it's uh, been derated here. Shares down 10% in spite of a 2% uplift in NAV over the year. Um one interesting point about that one is that it's going to make its first distribution fairly soon, I think, from its wind-up. Uh, it should be sometime in the first quarter, I imagine. So we'll have to see if that changes. Uh, there are some very good yields in this sector if you're a yield hunter. Uh, the average yield here is 9%. So I think some interesting trusts here, actually, and some, maybe some value to be unlocked. Uh, the next sector, Structured Finance, did very well indeed last year, up 15.8%. Uh, uh, some, again, very sort of unusual trusts here that I suspect many people don't bother looking at. They are sometimes denominated in other currencies. There's a couple of euro-based trusts here. Um, and the share prices are all over the place compared to the NAV returns. Uh, so, again, you have to look at it quite carefully on an individual basis. But my feeling is there's actually some tremendous value in this sector. I've always shied away a little bit from recommending these in my newsletter because I think they are quite specialist and esoteric and the potential of them to go wrong. But I think some of them are quite solid. And actually, you know, you look at something like Blackstone Loan Financing, which was okay last year, up 7.5%. Uh, that's on a discount of 34% uh, with a yield of 136 uh, and it's winding down. So, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting stats there and uh, that could do very well. Uh, some of the same things apply to the Chanavari Toro Income Fund. Again, you know, you've got a very high yield there of 14.3%. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, and a discount of 30 uh, now, you have to think about whether those dividends are going to continue or not. But um, nevertheless, I think this is a sector that repays some research. Uh, loans and bonds also did quite well, up 12.6%. Uh, some benefits here from the higher interest rates. Um, very good average yield on this sector as well of 8.1. Good returns from CFC, uh, sorry, CVC income and growth. Uh, 
And there's not too much I want to say about this, but I would just point out the 24 Select Monthly Income Fund, uh, SMIF, is a very unusual one that it does give you a monthly income. I think it might be pretty much the only investment trust to do that. Uh, what it does, it pays you a monthly uh, dividend of uh, 0.5 pence, and then it makes up a final dividend, uh, which is a larger one for the uh, 12th payment. But if you're looking for regular income, that's maybe one to think about. Uh, property debt. Um, this is a slightly unusual sector because actually there's a couple here that shouldn't really be here. Acuity RM at the top there. Uh, has a £6 million market cap and it's in the wrong sector, so I would ignore that one. Uh, Starwood European is uh, winding up. ICG Longbow also winding up. So really the only one to look at here, in my opinion, is real estate credit investments, which um, has been a very reliable performer over the years. Uh, I mean, in contrast to many trusts, actually, that have had quite a lot of issues in their portfolio, um, this trust has generally sailed through uh, with only one or two minor things, and it does offer a 9.4% yield. Uh, so again, you know, I think that's quite useful if you're looking to top up your income. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, now, a couple of other things. I, I sort of switched squish them onto uh, the same page, but obviously there's not nothing to connect forestry and growth capital and um, foresight um is obviously the only one of its kind um and the sort of initial euphoria of its launch has worn off um and because they had to write down the value of some of the land that they had that that factor of the nav but it's totally not confidence in the in the trust and the share price has dived it doesn't have the benefit of an income that might otherwise sustain interest in it. Um, it's going to take, I think, a little while for it to um, establish itself and and um, and recover that. So I suppose it, there's a bit of a recovery play in the in the discount, maybe, but uh, otherwise I think probably not very interesting. Looking now at the sort of growth capital things. Now, obviously, this has been a dreadful sector over uh, the last couple of years, most of that was concentrated in 2022, 23 wasn't quite so bad, although you have seen falls in the values of now sort of the Medical Chihalian Fund, and also particularly in the former Woodford Patient Capital Trust where um, the pain still comes. And they had to write down um, a couple of big positions. One of those was been over in AI, and also, I think what AMO Pharma, which didn't actually uh, meet its goals in the um, trial drug trials that it was doing. Um, within all of this, though, there may be some interesting things. Um, Trade Pitch Opportunities has been doing okay. It's got a bit more than sort of quoted exposure, and that may be the reason why it is performing okay. But but because it's been sort of new investments that the Schroeder's teams have made as opposed to the in-of fund, um, it does seem to be doing a bit better. Chrysalis uh, is, is one of my picks for this year. I, I do think because... Um, it's, it's Everything's been written down so far, and it has just hinted that it's making this disposal and and that will um aid it to a small uplift from the NAV, but also free up quite a lot of capital to allow it to tackle its um, put, um big discount. Uh, that could be a, a winner this year. <clears throat> Space fund, um I I'm intrigued by, but I don't know enough about really. Um Jade is one of these things that you should just always steer clear of. And um, they've tried to do all sorts of things over the years to try and reinvigorate it, including issuing stock at a discount. And, and yeah, they're, they're doing this, something again now. I think it's just not worth worrying about. Yeah, hedge funds next. Uh, very dull year. Quite a poor year, actually. Um, and uh, I think maybe hedge funds were something that people were thinking about during the extreme volatility of the COVID period. And, and now they'll probably move on, particularly if the outlook for interest rates uh, uh does come to play and actually we get falling rates next year and hopefully a rising market. Uh, I think probably we won't pay too much attention to these hedge funds. Uh, BH Macro, which had previously been a very strong performer, actually had a bad year because it was um, effectively caught out by the first quarter US banking collapse 
and the and the very sharp and sudden uh, change in interest rate expectations. It's easy to forget actually that we did start last year in fairly optimistic mood, and we weren't expecting the developments to occur quite as they did. Uh, so uh, I think it, it was it was not unreasonable that BH Macro was caught out by that. I think we all were, but nevertheless, that that really dragged the returns down here. As a result, I think of the of a couple of things. I mean, I think people seeing opportunities elsewhere and also the rather disappointing performance, money has been coming out of this sector. So we've seen some fairly sharp de-ratings here from a, an elevated uh, position. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to change uh, very much in the short term. So uh, infrastructure, and um, it's the perennial winner here through our infrastructure. Uh, but it's interesting, I think, to see Pantheon uh, bringing up the in second place here. So both of those funds are not just sort of investing in income producing infrastructure uh, and kind of just collecting the rent. They're, they're also trying to make capital gains by uh, investing in things that are, are actually growing too. Um, and 3i, that's, that's definitely worked over the years. Panting is just getting started on this, uh, and I think could could be a long term winner in the sector. We just have to wait and see. Its discount is a bit wider than some of the other ones, so I think it, should, it may be an interesting thing to have a look at. Um, we've had a lot of headlines around digital infrastructure over the year. There have mainly been negative ones from Digital Nine, um, because obviously we we had this whole issue with uh, it becoming completely overstretched in terms of his balance sheet and it had quite a lot of commitments to invest in his portfolio. He couldn't didn't have the money to do that. Um, and it's just sold off its prize asset and the price that it's achieved for that and the terms of that deal have been extremely disappointing. And that's led to another big derating. You can see this huge uh, share price fall. Um, it could be that that's now oversold, but I think that's, that's quite a risky thing. We'll have to wait and see how it works out. Um, GCP, uh, I've seen one out here only because there's quite a big gap between its uh, modest improvement in NAV and the share price return. So, again, you, you've got quite a big discount opportunity here. Um, it obviously tried to um, expand through merging with GCP um, asset backed income and the uh, RM infrastructure income, and both of those things didn't work out. Um, I don't think there was a, a big associated um, cost associated with, with that. I don't think they actually spent too much money on that, which is good news. But having not been able to achieve that, it's now rethinking what it can do in terms of um, its capital allocation. And so it will be looking at ways that it can sell off some of its assets and bring that discount down. And so I, I think that they'll be looking to reverse that in 2024. And you have seen other funds within the sector saying we would you know the, our discounts have just got stupid we're going to sell stuff off and um buy back stock uh, and more recently you've seen that in social public partnerships for example that they just know something this week when they're, they're doing that um so i, I do think that the, these infrastructure funds are quite serious about taking the discounts and they'd like to be on the front foot again and i can imagine BPGI is the lowest rate of these now. I did some, some about sort of six discount. I can imagine we'll, we will see a big chunk of the sector trading back at asset value again by the time we get to, through to the end of the year. Leasing um, has been really kind of weird and wonderful as usual. The big thing really was that although that there are new, A, new A380s being created, um, there is still demand from the second-hand market, which there was a big worry that there wouldn't be. But um, the direct number of two fund managed to sell a couple of planes. <clears throat> um, and that's extremely helpful. It's been able to use that money to return cash to shareholders. And it, that gives a big sort of tick in the box um, for the the other funds that are invested in this kind of area too. Uh, I mean, uh, Medio has, has less in the A380s and more in other kinds of planes. Um, so that's been one of the reasons why the NAVs have picked up here. By contrast, um, because you've seen sort of poor China um, and general sort of like slowing down global trade, uh, Taylor Maritime has seen a weakness in charter rates and that knocked its NEV. Um, this stuff that we've seen now about the Red Sea uh, and um, maybe charter rates picking up again 
could be helpful in the short term. That had, won't, flow through to, won't flow through to its OV yet, so we could see a small reversal of that. We'll have to wait and see. We've been trying to get them on the show, but as yet, unsuccessfully, but it'll be nice to hear from the horse's mouth. Um, private equity. Uh, this is really all about action. So three eyes become a sort of one-stop wonder. And it's got this supermarket chain in Europe, and it just goes from strength to strength and is more and more and more the NAV. Um, this is just to bounce back from really quite a poor 2022. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into the, that sort of like an, an ongoing thing. But the one of the ones that I really like is literacy capital. It, it just doesn't seem to put a foot wrong. Um, it did a couple of big disposals this year that have helped its NAV uh, move higher to so this thing called Colonel Global and also Button Up Box. Um, and it, yeah, they just seem to have really quite good sort of stock selection here. So that's that's obviously good news. At the other end of the table, uh, you've got Symphony, which is the Asian one, which is a bit more sort of wind wonderful. And um, they've finally given up the ghost. Um, I know AVR Global is one of the things that, that they've been pushing them to, to do something. Um, unfortunately, the, the NAV's taken a tumble <laughs> because um, they had some logistics business in Vietnam and they had to write those down. And yeah, they're, they're, they're sort of um, slightly odd things. Um, it probably is a bit too wind wonderful, a bit too hard to read to, to, to kind of play that wider discount narrowing gap. Um, as it, as it um, starts to return capital, I think. Again, discounts across the sector are still very wide, generally. Um, a lot of funds are trying to do something about that. Um, whether they work or not, I mean, it hasn't worked over the years, but we are, we are trying to, so we need to see what happens. Some of these things are in, are in runoff. Now, renewables <clears throat> was the sort of really disappointing sector, I think, of the year. Um, the NAFs returns here are not really worth getting too excited about, but it's the share price returns that uh, are the, the big story. Um, interesting that the old established larger funds seem to have held up a lot better. So things like Greencoat and Bluefield um, did a bit better than some of the other ones. Um, some of these things definitely looked oversold to me. Um, and we could some, some, see some recovery. Some of them have already started to move. It's been Gore Street is one of the ones that was on a massive discount and has come rattling in. Um, it's still on, you know, the slow discount still reasonably large, but um, nevertheless, we couldn't understand why it was so cheap um, because when it had a sort of much better globally diversified portfolio of battery storage than some of the other competitors. But that has sort of rectified itself. Um, and I am hopeful that, that we will see some positive moves this year. And it, it's interesting what the sector is doing because, because it can't issue stock to um, pursue the quite extensive pipelines that most of these things have. They're, they're looking for innovative ways of tackling that. Um, and the Bluefield uh, deal that's been announced this week where they've done a tie-up with a uh, fund of um, UK pension funds to, to actually fund their new pipeline and actually free up some, some cash for it too. That looks very really interesting to me. And these things, when they are doing these deals, uh, they're coming in at NAV or premiums to NAV. So, so that means that just, just reinforces the fact that the discounts are all wrong here and, and something used to happen. The only one where that really isn't the case is US Solar. Um, and they obviously decided they were going to give up, tried to put their portfolio up for sale. Nobody was interested in buying it. And they had to basically come back and say, well, actually, realistically, then we probably is have a value. So we have to write that down. That was that one. Um, and you also maybe got a headwind from the, the dollar. I'm looking forward as we go through the, uh, through the 2024, that the dollar may be weakening relative to sterling and other currencies too. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get so fed up talking about this one. Uh, Hypnosis Songs Fund, one of the big stories of the year. We talked about it because it just kept on pumping out exciting news. Um, the reality, if you look at the figures, is actually much more dull. You know, I mean, it it uh, the NAV dropped by eleven percent, the shares dropped by eleven percent. Um, 
of course, there's a great deal behind that. Uh, and the enormous discount of about 50% on which the shares currently reside. Uh, I mean, my sense here is that um, it's quite difficult to rate this trust a buy or a sell, actually. And so, you know, probably existing holders will just sit with it and see what happens. I think it's hard to rate it a buy because there's just so much uncertainty around it. That um, And there's many other uh, more interesting opportunities around that uh, you can you can have more certainty about. Uh, and it's hard to rate a sell on that discount because actually there's an experienced board in place now uh, and I think they will slowly bring some resolution to the issues around uh, the trust, obviously the big one being whether the managers continue or not. Um, there's a lot to resolve still, but hopefully it will get sorted out this year and you know we should see uh some narrowing of that discount one would hope but let, let's let's see a uh, uk commercial property well this is interesting actually because uh, you know property is clearly the most interest rate sensitive sector of the lot and if you looked at these figures a month ago they looked far worse actually than they do now but it's all to do with the comparatives because there was a big big drop off here in the final quarter of 2022 and that's where the real damage was done actually that was where the navs really plunged so actually if you're looking at the calendar year 23 it wasn't that bad uh so in fact here uh on balance we're up marginally and um no great surprise to see aew uk reads at the top because again that seems to be a very consistent trust that somehow I think through, you know, very high quality estate management here uh, and active management, they, they seem to be able to extract value uh, somewhat better than many other managers. And you have a high dividend yield here of 8% plus. So that helps the overall return. Um, but generally there have been some very sharp deratings in this sector because Investors have fled. You know, it's uh, they think, well, it's you know, it's interest rate sensitive. Uh, we could potentially have a sharp economic downturn, which is then going to damage demand. So you get hit twice. You get hit by interest rates first, and then by the prospects of recession secondly. Now it may be that we pass that interest rate peril now. And uh, 2024, you know, may be the year that we pass the recession peril as well. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. There's still quite a lot of risk here, which is why these deratings are in place. But I do think if you're a discount hunter and you are also a contrarian, then this is a fairly fertile hunting ground. And you get paid to wait. You know, the average dividend yield here is 7.2%. There are some high dividend yields if you want to take more risk. Uh, regional REIT is the obvious one, you know, office properties, that's pretty risky, but uh, you get a 14.3% yield. And that's based on a dividend that's been cut already. So, you know, I think that might well be sustainable. So, you know, it's been a difficult year, but I feel that the property sector has actually come through it you know, re in reasonable shape, actually. Uh, and I do think if you're a bargain hunter, this is a decent place to look. Oh, and look at some of the specialist sectors within the property. Um, first of all, healthcare. They now look to quite good, and that's because they've got largely inflation-linked rents. So obviously, high inflation, higher rent, higher value. Simple as that, really. Um, so th that's not being a bad place to be. It's interesting that the uh, impact has derated um, relative to quite a good any big um, return, and I'm not sure why that would be. Um, so I, maybe that way, well, that one might be worth a look. The story in logistics, uh, we, we talked about, that we've already had this kind of big hit uh, that Andrew mentioned in 2022. There, some of these things carried on going down, though, in 2023. But um, our, our property owners, Richard has talked about before, there, there's still quite a lot of demand for logistics property. Um, and the sort of speculative supply side of thing has dried up because of what's been going on and so rents are being squeezed higher um and so it should be quite good news for for now going forward um so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see on that but i i do think these things have probably stopped derating they should have stopped falling Civitas, uh it's kind of underscored by the fact that the 
Civitas got bid for. Sorry, so Triple Point got Triple Point is underscored by the fact that Civitas got um, bid for. Um, and you've seen a sort of pick up in the price, but that's still quite a big discount on that one. Whether anybody will come along and take this one out, honestly, can't tell you. Um, generally, residential properties, um, there's been a bit of sort of write down on, on valuations for some residential secure income, but that hasn't really flowed through into everything. And again, it's always sort of balance of play of, of what rents are doing. Um, the, the real horror story, though, remains home rate. We haven't doesn't the numbers don't look too exciting, but that's because obviously it's been suspended for the whole year. <coughs> um, I'm hoping that we we will um, see some more resolution to those problems as we go through the 2024. There could be quite a big hit for the now to come. Obviously, we've, we've seen <coughs> already the, the the evaluation of property has been done now, and that's a big sort of 60% hit to what they paid for those properties um, originally. So when it does come back, I think it will go to discount where it can be quite a big fall and then it's going to be all about how much money can you get back from the legally, from the uh, various court cases that are going on. <clears throat> um, in Europe, the, the logistics funds, again, have also hit again because they, they, they carried on falling. It's exactly the same story as it is in the UK, though. The, the rents don't look too bad. And again, I, I think that's probably the bottom for the things that I tried to Euro box. Finksbury had to suspend its dividend because um, it wasn't achieving the same pace of disposals within its um, uh, Berlin uh, residential property portfolio that it had, it had been doing. But it's been trying to step that up. There was more of a sort of first half problem and it's trying to step that up. So again, I think we might be seeing the bottom of that one. Um, and the, the sort of solid story in that sector has been the Schroeder Fund. Um, that, that's sort of, seems to be okay, but it is quite dull. And then within the kind of rest of the world stuff, these are very weird and wonderful, these four funds. Um, I actually have a small position in the Cuban one, Siva. Um, it's got a kind of recovery going on within its um, hotel income. Um, because of obviously COVID um, reopening, and they've just um, opened their new Trinidad hotel as well. And the prices they're charging for the rooms are quite exorbitant, so um, it may be that that does okay. Um, and it's all about now, really, can you get the income out? And they, they were able to to take some some cash out of the um, subsidiary that holds the um, conference centre there this year. So. That's one of the reasons why the nervous kicked up a bit. Um, this Macau thing is supposed to be um, um, winding down. It's been doing that for years. It just goes on and on and on. And I'm not quite sure when that's ever going to happen, but we'll have to wait and see. So there we go. We've uh, rattled through the whole sector. I know we've run on. And thank you very much for staying with us. Um, we'll be back next week. Um, well, I'll be back next week. And as, as I promised, talking to Augmented Fintech, and we'll we'll see what they've got to say. Um, and then we've got a sort of line up going through the year. Um, obviously, Andrew will be back on the first second of February, I hope. And um, I uh, hope your twenty twenty four is a more profitable one than maybe twenty twenty three was. Please. thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.